Hey, happy Friday. I'm back to the studio, and this week, Apple got serious about foldable iPhones, apparently. Google went all in on AI with Gemini, and WhatsApp became interoperable. At least they announced that they will become so. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. <music> This video was sponsored by NordVPN. Okay, we'll start to brief with the leaked Google Pixel Fold 2 via Android Authority. This looks like a more narrow phone that is something between the Samsung Fold series and the original Pixel Fold one. And the new model is also leaked to skip the Tensor G3 and to go straight for the Tensor G4, launching right alongside the Pixel 9 in the Fold, which makes a lot of sense to me. Then also this week, Jerry Rig Everything showed that the Vision Pro outside display is actually covered in a plastic, meaning that you'll have to be really careful with scratches. While I fix it, found that the battery pack just seems to be basically three iPhone-sized batteries stacked on top of each other, and that the micro OLED display is almost definitely from Sony, and that it has 54 times smaller pixels than an iPhone 15 Pro display. Pretty crazy. It's just too bad that you won't be able to reset your device if you have forgotten your passcode and that you'll have to go back to the store to do so. Weird times. Then moving on, Disney Plus has started to crack down on password sharing, at least in the US, and the company has also invested $1.5 billion into Fortnite and into Epic Games, making this the company's biggest ever push into gaming. Then, in unexpected news this week, Mozilla announced having a new interim CEO as Mitchell Baker stepped down to the position of executive chair, and this happened on the heels of the company also launching a paid Mozilla monitor service for wiping your data off the web in places that you don't want it to be on, so change is in the air. Then, in EU tech regulation news, there's a new right to repair agreement with some new and very strict pro-consumer rules, which includes companies having to give you 12 months of extra warranty after a product was repaired, and also better availability of spare parts, and a prohibition against using, quote, contractual hardware or software-related barriers to repair, such as impending the use of secondhand, compatible, and 3D printed spare parts by independent repairers. As with all agreements, this still has to go through a really long process before it actually becomes a law, but I guess this is a big win for repairability. Then, in more good news, there is now an eSIM transfer tool for Android. This allows you to move an eSIM from one Android phone to another without having to ask your carrier, and it has appeared on the Pixel 8 and the Galaxy S24 Ultra so far at least. Nice! Also this week, ARM stock was up more than 50%, a huge gain, after showing that the company is a clear winner in AI. And then in insane news, the Biden administration now requires large cryptocurrency miners to report their energy use, because apparently Currently, just 137 mining operations in the US account for an incredible 2.3% of national electricity usage. What the F? And talking of insanity, Taylor Swift pulled an Elon asking her lawyers to politely tell people to just stop tracking her private chat because I guess as it turns out, her flights that include things like a 13-minute hop from one end of a city to another end of that same city just weren't a great look for her. Hmm. Okay, as for my first story of the week, we got credible reports claiming that Apple is actually building foldable prototypes for at least two types of iPhones. The report is from the generally reliable The Information, which quotes a source who says that Apple is working on both a clamshell-style foldable, plus also a kind of iPad-style foldable too. Of course, Apple can see that market researchers like Counterpoint claim that foldable shipments are finally picking up, meaning that they now make up a decent chunk of the flagship Android shipments at least. And we've also heard before that the company was making foldable iPhone prototypes in the past already. They reportedly put development on hold around 2020 once already, but now they're ramping them up again. Apple apparently wants to have their foldable phones be half as thick as a regular iPhone, so that when you fold it in half, it becomes kind of like regular thickness, but they're not quite there with their prototypes yet, and they're also unhappy about the crease, so there's still quite a bit of work to do. Reports claim that 2026 is the earliest launch for a foldable from Apple, despite the company having approached at least one component supplier in Asia already. And meanwhile, also this week, Tim Cook's interview with Vanity Fair also included a description of him wandering around, quote, restricted rooms with foldable iPhones. So there's another kind of half confirmation this week as well. There still seem to be quite a lot of people on the internet who think that Apple will never make a foldable in the same way that they thought that they'd never make a large phone before the iPhone 6 as well. But I don't think that's the case. They're just waiting for this technology to mature to the point where they actually want to make one. Okay, for my second story of the week, Google completely revamped its AI portfolio with Gemini this week, and even Apple offered us a glimpse of what they're working on. 
So for Google, the company started with a rebrand and now Gemini is the new name for all of their AI stuff. Bard was renamed to Gemini and so was Duet AI and even the Google Assistant is slowly being retired too. Meanwhile, Gemini got a dedicated new website called gemini.google.com and also a dedicated mobile app which is starting on Android and in the US. Long live Gemini, I guess. Then second this week, Gemini Advanced, which is powered by the company's most high-end Gemini Ultra model, just got announced as well. Gemini Advanced powered by Gemini Ultra seems like a branding nightmare if you ask me, but anyway, it's here now and there's also a price. There's a $20 a month subscription called Google One AI Premium, and this one now includes the fancy new Gemini Advanced and also a bunch of the usual premium Google services all in one bundle. This is now rolling out globally, and I think especially with all the other Google services included as well, at $20 a month, it seems to be at least in line with OpenAI and Microsoft in terms of pricing. And third, Google has just added a toggle in the main Google app to switch between Search and Gemini, which is the first time that the sacred search box got a major competitor internally from the company since it was launched. Sundar Pichai is apparently preparing for a future where search isn't king, which is pretty wild. Search was the one and only thing at the center of the company since it was born, and so Gemini being placed in that similar position now is quite a shift. All of this happened while Microsoft just completely revamped their AI portfolio under the Copilot brand as well, and they even launched a massive Super Bowl ad for it. And also while Apple released their first AI model called MGIE2. Apple's MGIE is specifically designed to allow users to edit existing images using natural language instructions. So you can tell it to, for example, change the toppings of a pizza or to improve the lighting of an image or something similar. And the model is surprisingly open source and available on GitHub for anyone to try too. Obviously, that's a smaller start than all of Gemini or all of Copilot, but I think it's supposed to signal that, hey, Apple is working on this tech as well. Also this week, WhatsApp announced that their chat app is officially going to start working with other chat apps, including the encrypted ones as well, as the company is now starting to be forced to open up. As we said before, WhatsApp is one of the two messaging platforms that is big enough in the European Union to be classified as a gatekeeper under the EU's new Digital Markets Act, so Meta has to make these interoperable by law. The other one on the list is Messenger, of course, which is also owned by Meta, and for which presumably everything I'm about to say is true too. And this week, an engineering director at the company went on record to describe how it plans to open up. Specifically, they said that they will require any other service that they want to work with to support the Signal Encryption Protocol, which is the de facto industry standard open source solution, or at least something else that is just as secure. And the other service providers will also have to sign an agreement with Meta first. I guess the idea here is that the other services will be sending messages and contents to Meta and vice versa as well. And so these services all have to sign a kind of agreement with each other. WhatsApp, I guess, intentionally did not say that this interoperability will be limited to the EU either. So we could be looking at the European Union setting global tech standards once again, just like they did with USB-C. Now, the full details covering the exact implementation from WhatsApp will be published in March, but we already have two potential limitations that we know of. First, only WhatsApp and Messenger are big enough under the EU to be gatekeepers, so no other service has to be interoperable with these two. And indeed, the Swiss privacy-focused messaging app called Threema, for example, has already said that they won't support WhatsApp because WhatsApp is closed source, while others have not actually made any statements that I'm aware of yet. And second, a few months ago, we heard that, that Google was working on its own interoperability solution for Google Messages too, but they were using MLS, a different open source standard. So I guess the companies who want to have interoperability will first have to settle on some shared standards before we can actually start to chat across apps. But still, with both Google and Meta saying that they'll support interoperability in the future, we should have some sort of a solution pretty soon. So thanks EU, I guess. Now, the Digital Markets Act is making unprecedented changes to the entire internet. But you know what one service is that you'll want to have even when all the dust settles? That's right, a really good VPN. And if you get one, why not get the fastest VPN around according to independent speed tests, which would be NordVPN. Look, you're a techie, so you already know what a VPN is for. You can watch some shows from abroad, you can unlock geo-blocked websites, you can make sure that your traffic isn't compromised on dodgy public networks, you can get the best prices regardless of where you're shopping from, etc. I just came back from holidays and it was a real blessing to be able to access services from back home while I was abroad. 
NordVPN has 6,000 different servers and 60 plus countries to choose from, so you always have one that is close to you and also close to where you want to have your traffic routed for optimal efficiency. Nord works so well that you can easily stream shows without any lag, you can do online gaming, basically anything, and the company has also open sourced big parts of their service so the security conscious folks can check out that your traffic is properly encrypted and secure. And with my link, which is nordvpn.com slash checkout, which is also linked down in the description, you can also get an extra good deal. You get four extra months if you pick a two-year plan and also a 30-day money-back guarantee if you don't like the service. There's basically no risk in giving it a try, so check them out at nordvpn.com slash Friday Checkout, and I'll see you in the next video.